Hi there, everybody. I'd like to talk through the What Do You Know questionnaire uh, that we went through at the beginning of the semester really briefly just to make sure everyone has the same set of information, uh, help reinforce some of these uh, core concepts. So the primary capabilities of GIS, I got a lot of really diverse answers here, and the key is it's more than visualization of data. It's more than analysis of data. Uh, GIS makes it possible for us to collect spatial data, store spatial data, share spatial data, obviously analyze and visualize, um, and more for sure. Um, but I just wanted to make sure everybody understands the breadth of things that GIS is capable of doing. It's more than just making pretty maps. Uh, the second question was to have you draw a globe and label the following details, equator, latitude, longitude lines. And the reason for this was um, a lot of people mix up latitude and longitude, and I just want to make sure that um, we're all starting from the same place. The equator, latitude lines, um, think of them as ladder rungs. You'd climb up a ladder. Longitude lines, um, I think of them as being long because they're always wrapping all the way around. Um, they are longer. Latitude lines, uh, their circumference gets smaller and smaller as you approach the poles. So most people nailed that. Um, so that's that. Scale on the, so on the surface of a globe is the same in every direction. This wasn't meant to be a trick question. If you answered it in a way where you were trying to get into some of the nitty gritty details like um, the geoid and how wonky the surface is and how it's not a perfect sphere, that's going a little too far. Um, the, what I was getting at is that the globe is the only um, representation of the Earth on which scale is the same everywhere. We don't have to deal with projections. We don't have to deal with skewing or distortions um, like that. Um, it's just the same everywhere. So, um, yeah, just this is baseline stuff, not meant to be tricky. Um, why do we have so many projections then to visualize the globe on a flat surface? And there's two kind of fundamental pieces to this. Projections are customized, and there's two, um, two, well, probably three to five, but let's just start with two um, kind of major breakdowns. Number one, there's always going to be a regional focus for a projection. If we're dealing with North America, if we're dealing with Utah, if we're dealing with Europe, there's going to be a different geographic focus. Um, and then, as you know, there are different metrics that we can preserve, like area, distance, shape, angle, direction, things like that. And then on top of that, we have um, the idea of where the light source is coming from in a projection. So this is just your classic projection wiki page. But depending on how we want to preserve these different uh, metrics, um, we're going to use a cone or a cylinder or a flat plane. Um, and then, let me zoom down to, like we talked about this in class a little bit, that the light source can come from different places. The light source can come from, you know, within the center of the object or from behind the object or even an infinite distance away from the object. So there are so many different uh, nuances that go into creating a projection. That's how we end up with so many different types because we're trying to customize it to suit our purposes. Um, as accurately as possible. Then I ask um, North American datum of 1983 whether or not this is the best coordinate system for making area calculations in the continental US. So yeah, I'm trying to throw you off a little bit. I'm talking about specific places, but it boils down to this. Can you calculate area in a geographic coordinate system? And the answer is false. You cannot calculate area in a geographic coordinate system. So here I am in ArcMap. Um, I've got a data frame. Let's look at the properties. The data frame is set to a geographic coordinate system, North American datum of 1983, and I want to calculate the area of this watershed. Go into the attribute table, over to the area, field, and I'm going to recalculate this in units of my choice. So calculate geometry for area. And notice that if I use the coordinate system of the data itself, which is in a projection, a projected coordinate system, I am allowed to calculate area. But if I use the data frame, the geographic coordinate system, area is disabled. 
We've shifted to degrees. We've got non-uniform units of measure here, and ARC doesn't allow that to happen. So this is kind of a trick question, but at the same time, I'm trying to figure out who is paying attention in the intro class. Uh, yeah, so no, you can't, you can't do this because it's geographic. The most common coordinate system used in Utah tends to be um, NAT 83, UTM Zone 12. Um, this is more, again, just a baseline to kind of see who's picking up on some of these details. Hillshade, hillshade surfaces. Um, it, hillshade values have absolutely nothing to do with anything real except for a color. So uh, let's turn this off and this off. Here's a hillshade. Looks gorgeous. It's a, a fantastic display tool. Look, you can see the reservoir here. You can even pick up on this little dam. You can see trails cutting up here. It's fabulous. But range of values of 0 to 254. These represent what color gray it is. And how gray it is has to do with where the light source is coming from and what the elevations are. But these values don't allow us to extract information about slope or elevation or terrain roughness or um, I mean you name it there's nothing here except gray the elevation itself this is where we can extract information if you wanted to get at slope or terrain roughness we could calculate those secondary surfaces from elevation but there's nothing of value here at all and that's really important to understand don't include these in legends Yes, use them on your maps as a display tool, but you don't ever want to try and calculate or analyze anything with these data or with those uh, values. Okay, so that brings us down to this pretty rotten question about query types. And what I was going at here is that there's a difference between spatial queries and attribute queries. And then logical queries are, we start, are where we start kind of, um, I think of them as the Boolean searches. So not just um, you know, pick something, pick an area that is next to this area. That's kind of spatial. Um, how many rivers fall within this watershed? But a logical query is more like um, taking the attributes and setting things up. Uh, tell me um, how, how many parcels have at least 10 private homes that are worth over a million dollars each. So we're setting up kind of um, Boolean queries that way. An attribute can get that, can be the same way, but it was kind of a, it was kind of a rough question. Um, this, this number nine here was about um, how you would go about calculating population density given a population field and an area field. Um, here's a blank field that we're going to calculate population density into and what command would you use and the answer is field calculator because you're calculating between fields. Calculate geometry um, lets us calculate areas, lengths, perimeters, um, XY locations and things like that. Um, statistics is what we can use for example, if you wanted to know what the total area of this column is, or if you selected certain records and wanted to know what the total area was, you'd right-click and use statistics, and you'd get the min, the max, the mean, and the sum. Um, and that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I was going for there. Um, so the, the distinguishing characteristics between vector and raster, what I was getting at here is that vector are XY discrete, uh, coordinate types of um, data sets. So XY locations connected make lines and then wrapping them around to the same um, start and end location creates a polygon. But it's discrete um, and XY coordinate driven. Whereas a raster is a grid or a matrix, um, very much like an image where you have a solid field of pixels and each pixel contains a value. So very not discrete um, and very continuous instead. Those are the types of words or descriptions I was looking for here. And classic examples for vector data are points, um, points, lines, polygons would also work here, but points that represent cities, um, polylines that represent roads or rivers, um, polygons that represent parcels or building footprints or states or things like that. For rasters, any kind of an image, um, you could model elevation, slope, precipitation, wind speed, um, land cover type, things that are continuous in nature. Okay, 
Almost done. Uh, explain what it means to select by location or attribute. And I'll just show you a quick example here. Um, let's zoom back out. Okay. Um, selecting by attribute does exactly that. We make a selection of features based on something about their attributes. So if I look in the streams attribute table, I have things like um, a bunch of technical stuff here. Um, the name of the river, I've got lengths, I've got flow directions, I've got whether it's a major river, um, submerged uh, may mean that it's like a buried. Yeah, I'd have to look that up and see where that is and I don't want to do that right now. Um, so for example, in here I could select by the name, name equals get unique values, and we could select all the features or records that are called lithograph fork. And if I open the attribute table back up, we can see that we have one thing that's called lithograph fork. If I go in here and zoom to it, there it is have no idea where this is in the world. I'm not going to add a base map and zoom out to figure it out, but that's how you select by an attribute. We were selecting by name. Um, if we want to instead select by location, then what we're doing is selecting features based on their proximity to other features in the map. So if I wanted to select features from the streams data set based on their uh, spatial relationship to the watershed, like let's say I want to know how many of these streams are within Big Cottonwood Canyon. I have different options here. I can um, choose all the streams that intersect the watershed, touch it in some way, that are within a distance of the watershed, um, are completely within or are within the watershed, completely within the watershed, touch the boundary of the watershed, Let's just see what happens. Okay, so I've just selected all the stream segments that are within Big Cottonwood Canyon. And I can go back here, open my attribute table, and see that I have 179 records selected. And then I could do something with those. Maybe I want to calculate the total area, or I mean, sorry, the total length of those. So I could go in here and use the statistics tool and see that I have a sum of about 146,000 meters total of length of streams within Big Cottonwood Canyon. Okay, um, I have a, a separate video in which I talk about what happens with red exclamation marks and why um, I'm going to give you a hard time if you submit an MXD document. It's not because I'm a control freak and I um, expect you to do things a certain way. It's because I literally can't see your maps if you submit them as an MXD. So even if I wanted to download 200 MXD documents every week as I'm evaluating and, um, and then wait five minutes for ArcMap to open each one, which I definitely do not want to do, you know that I would just see red exclamation points and none of your data would actually display for me. So you have to compress your maps, export them as PDF, um, not because I will get mad if you, if you don't, as some of you said, uh, but because I just truly want to evaluate your work and can't see it if you submit an MXD doc. So that's that. Um, we will talk about this uh, in a second video. Uh, if you have any questions about these, please let me know. Thanks.